The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. Stock buyer fatigue sets in. Attractive alternatives crop up and earnings season shifts into third gear. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Stocks taking a bit of a breather after the S&P and the Dow closed at record highs last week. The S&P down four-tenths of one percent. And the best performing part of the stock market last week was small caps. It is the leading decliner today off by one and a half percent. VIX is below 20, but it has been trending higher and is elevated relative to its year-to-date average. Uh, The dollar is firmer, and we should note that the Mexican peso is one of the, the worst performing major currencies against the dollar. Uh, Peso losing ground as the Trump trade is very much intact. Uh, The expectation that uh, proposed tariffs from Donald Trump would disrupt U.S. trade with Mexico. Yeah, as you're speaking here right now, you're seeing treasuries, that 10-year treasury, pumping up against 4.2 percent. Kind of hard to believe here that just about one month ago, here on this day, you actually had a treasury yield that was all the way back down at 3.6 percent. Here on this Monday, now a flirt with that 4.2 percent level. And if you believe the CIO over at T Row price benchmark yields may test 5% in the next six months. An out of consensus call to be sure, but it underscores that massive debate going on right now about Fed direction, a debate with clear implications for equities. The key risk for rising bond yields is that you start to flow through to hitting stocks, right? Because bonds are in the stocks, whether, uh, whether you like it or not, and that discount rate both affects stocks directly and then, of course, starts to tighten economic conditions. And that was Bob Elliott there. David Costin and his team over at Goldman, well, they're already seeing major structural changes afoot for stocks, saying that that 13 percent a year return that we saw for the S&P on average in the past decade, that's a thing of the past. They see average annual returns as low as 3 percent going forward. And that's largely a function in their mind of more investor money looking to other assets, including bonds, for better returns. But before we get to that downshift in returns, the latest MLive Pulse survey of Bloomberg Terminal users showing that expectations for further market gains by year end are there. Earnings, the main driver, and we're going to get a big scoop of that this week with more than 20 percent of the S&P 500 companies due to report that includes names like Tesla, Boeing, UPS, GM, Coke, IBM and Texas Instruments. And the list goes on and on. All right. Well, you mentioned investor money moving to other assets, looking to other assets. This is a visual here of the amount of cash that's piled up on the sidelines, almost six and a half trillion dollars sitting in money market accounts. Now, when the Fed began cutting rates in September, that barely made a dent. You saw weekly net outflows this little red bar here on the bottom panel, reinforcing the belief that investors would rather put that money to work than accept lower rates. But that outflow didn't really last, and the money parked there has proven to be fairly sticky. J.P. Morgan analysts say that money market funds do not typically experience outflows until the Fed is further along the easing cycle and the Treasury curve has normalized and become stable. All right. Well, our next guest actually says that maybe it is finally time to bail on bills, maybe extend duration just a touch. Let's get some insights out of Jerome Schneider. He's managing director and head of short term portfolio management and funding over at PIMCO. Great to see you once again here, Jerome. And let's start here with all that cash, I guess, on the proverbial sideline here. Doesn't necessarily need to come out of fixed income. But is there some sense here that people are willing to maybe extend duration just a bit? Well, I think there's two elements of that. What's going on, Romain? Number one, you have the consistent element of the drumbeat of money market funds attraction. And admittedly, that's probably going to continue for some period of time. Typically, we see investors, typically retail investors, continue to hover in those money market funds for another 12 to 18 months beyond the initial rate cut. The second component, though, is how you continue to find resilient returns after those money market yields continue to decline. And we've already seen a decline of 50 to 60 basis points in money market funds. It hasn't necessarily been the alarm to sound people to move out of money market funds yet, but it is the alarm for people to begin to reconfigure and have portfolios positioned for better total returns. And part of that total return perspective is ability to generate price appreciation in bond portfolios. So one element is people looking for diversification away from equities and other more volatile risk asset classes. Mm -hmm. The second allocation is focus, people focus on looking at total returns with a lower volatility footprint. And that's exactly where we're seeing bit more important folks focus on moving out of bills, focusing on the front end of the yield curve, predominantly the five-year point, and doing so in a methodical way over the course of the next few weeks, the next few months, and more importantly, the next few years as they look at 
fixed income is that alternative. Well, what's kind of the entry point for maybe those investors that don't have that exposure, or at least not in a meaningful way? Because the narrative was pretty clear just a few weeks ago. Rates were going down, and they were going down meaningfully. We seem to have stalled. You have some folks saying that the Fed might not be aggressive, and you had Torsten Slock at Apollo just today saying he doesn't think the Fed's going to cut again in November at all. Yeah, I think what's most important here is, is that, you know, the Fed is intent on securing that soft landing, and they have a real possibility of doing so. I think the data dependency by the market is really something that became focal point for the past few weeks. We've recalibrated to higher yields of 40 to 50 basis points since that point in time. And more importantly, when we think about this, the evolution of securing that soft landing means that the possibility of continued easing remains intact. But maybe the, 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 the motivation and, more importantly, the method of how they're going to ease might be more elongated than the market had expected. And that's simply the recalibration, a natural recalibration that we should come to expect over that point in time. For investors, practically speaking, what we want to do is help avoid the fixation on the market-to-market, moment-to-moment move of data and really focus on the bigger-term opportunity here, which is yields are high potential for total returns for investment portfolios is also high at this point in time. So the point being is that the exact precision of when you enter into allocating a fixed income is a little bit less meaningful in terms of investor returns than people had suspected back you know, when rates were back at 0%. The time is effectively now to begin to allocate to fixed income, which mm. there is a structural underweight, which remains, and then move beyond that. And so while people are fixated on the Fed, the yeah. reality is, is that this might be a more elongated process. People are fixated on the Fed. They're also worried about the election. How are you thinking about how the election changes things up? Uh, Matt Hornback over at Morgan Stanley says Treasuries are better positioned this time around than in 2016 uh, when we had a GOP sweep of the White House and Congress. Right. Well, first and foremost, there is obviously a lot of volatility that's going to be perceived to come out of the election. There's other risks in the marketplace, too, not to differentiate, but geopolitical risks. We also have longer term risk with regard to liquidity. We had a speech from Lori Logan earlier this morning focusing on those structural elements. So there's a lot of things to discern as professional portfolio managers as well as investors around within the marketplace. The question you ultimately have to answer is what venues offer the best risk premium given these uncertainties? And that's where you can find a little bit of that shelter in the fixed income space right now, despite the backup in yields, despite the outlook of where the economy is going. Generally speaking, a growth outlook that we share at PIMCO is that you're still going to have a growth outlook of somewhere around 1.5% over the course of the next year. That's still a positive inertia. And so despite these outcomes of tariffs and things that happen, we still see some positive outlooks to the economy, which the Fed is going to have to remain focused on, Mm -hmm. but at the same time continue to ease back to that neutral rate of a three handle something. Within fixed income, um, Jerome, where do you want to be? I look at investment grade uh, spreads and they're pretty narrow, around 80-ish basis points. Uh, High yield um, has narrowed the spread to uh, 2.89 percentage points. Well, a couple things to highlight here, Scarlett. Number one, you want to put yourself in a position where assets that you buy are going to have price appreciation. Treasury bills don't have price appreciation. That's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you want to be in the higher quality elements. So while we don't forecast a hard landing here at PIMCO, and we think the soft landing is more in the realm of possibilities given by the Fed's reactions, one thing we, we want to do is remain up in quality. We can do that predominantly in agency mortgages, as an example, asset-backed securities as a diversifier. And the third thing, just to remain obvious, but in very important in this environment, is be diversified. Approach portfolio complexes, specifically in fixed income, for with an eye on diversification and a high eye to higher quality liquidity. This will give you ample runway to pivot and take advantage of liquidity opportunities when they reveal themselves. And it might be in the next few weeks as we approach the election or year-end, or it might be further out. But that's a place where you can have a balance of price appreciation, hopefully producing total returns along the way. All right, Jerome, got to leave it there. Always a great conversation. Jerome Schneider kicking us off to the close, managing director and head of short-term portfolio management and funding over at PIMCO. Coming up a little bit later here on the program, we're going to talk about that big earnings report from Boeing this week that could be overshadowed by a big labor union vote, a breakdown of what could be a wild Wednesday for the aerospace giant. Plus, trendy furniture giving way to great growth trends over at RH. The home product store getting an upgrade from Wedbush. We speak to the analysts behind that call. And happening right now, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, CFTC Chair Rostin Benham, all speaking today at SIFMA's annual conference. A conversation up ahead on Capital Markets with Ken Benson, President of the Securities Industries Main Association. Stick with us. A lot more coming up here on The Close on Bloomberg.
Eric's earnings debut as CEO of Boeing has gained an element of surprise. Workers will vote on that same day on whether to accept the plane maker's latest labor deal proposal and end their five week long strike. Investors are hopeful the union workers will accept the tentative deal on Wednesday, allowing the plane maker to finally start its path to recovery. George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now to discuss. So, George, um, does it matter at all what the earnings look like if the union can't get past this latest uh, offer from the plane maker? Because last time around, we thought that they had a deal that union leaders accepted, but the union voted it down. Yeah, I think it, this earnings call really, no, it's not going to matter much, right? So everything they're going to report on is past history. We already know what the cash burn was from operations is a burn of 1.3 billion. We know their cash balances, which is this, I think this most important uh, piece of data after cash burn. Uh, we know it's 10 and a half billion. We know it's down around the area they need, the minimum that they need to operate the company. So we, need, we know they either need to generate some more cash, which means the union's got to come off strike or they got to go into the marketplace and raise cash. Uh, which would dilute existing shareholders. So I think that was the most important thing we were going to hear in this earnings. They pre-released it, uh, and it'll be really hard to talk about the business forward yeah. uh, when the union is still out on strike, and we won't know to the end of day Wednesday. So it's not going to be much of uh, any, any great information coming out of the call. How involved is Kelly Orberg in these union negotiations? I know last time that there was an agreement that went to the union for a vote. He was not so much personally involved. It seemed like he was a little bit on the sidelines. But obviously the stakes are higher now that the strike has been ongoing. Is he involved uh, at all? I mean... He may not be involved directly in the negotiations, uh, but we know that it, this is really important, right, because this is uh, an important part of his cost structure going forward. Uh, you know, we saw him, him uh, release that uh, memo to the, uh, you know, to the employees, sort of laying the groundwork for the difficult straits Boeing is in, I think trying to uh, encourage them to dig deep and work harder. Uh, and again, you know, the outcome of this negotiation with this union is going to be the cost basis for his most important airplane, the 737. So while I don't expect him to be at the table talking to the union, yeah. he's definitely appraised and understands everything that's going on in those negotiations yeah. and what they're giving. Just real quickly here, George, I mean, even if we do get to a point where Ortberg can get Boeing past this and sort of back to some sense of normalcy, they're still facing a, a landscape when it comes to air airlines and aircraft orders, it's probably going to look a little bit different. Just last week, uh, we just learned about, of course, uh, Spirit Airlines uh, getting, I guess, a little bit more of a time here to work out their debt situation, but there's no guarantee that's going to save this airline. Yeah, no, Spirit Airlines, they've got to renegotiate their, um, they've got a bond deal that's tied to their loyalty program. That's the big deal here, right? The, the credit card companies essentially agreed to get out of the way. Uh, temporarily, but by year end, they've got to negotiate a deal for that uh, for that large loyalty program bond. I think it's six hundred million dollars. That that's the challenge. That's what they've got to get past now. All right, George Ferguson over at Bloomberg Intelligence. A closer look at what's been going on with Spirit Airlines, and a much closer look at what could be going on with Boeing. Those earnings set to drop on Wednesday. Full coverage right here on Bloomberg when it happens. And speaking of travel and airplanes, well, let's talk about whether we're actually going to be traveling that much this winter holiday season. According to the latest data out there, a new survey shows that we're apparently booking cheaper accommodations and shorter trips, uh, Scarlet Food. So basically, people still going to take those holiday trips, but maybe for two days instead of five, and maybe they'll be staying at a Motel 6 instead of five. Or maybe the they'll be asking to stay at your place or my place as that's well. That's not going to happen. Yeah, my, my family knows that. So, yeah. <laughs> You've already told everyone oh, that's oh, not going to yeah, happen. They know the ground rules. But I mean, the idea is that yeah. accommodations have become so expensive, and in a lot of cities, uh, Airbnb is no... Airbnb is no longer an option either, which has given the hotels free reign to jack up their prices, too. Yeah, and I'd, it'd be interesting, too, because we talk about this idea. This is, for a lot of people, this is kind of necessary travel, mm -hmm. right? It's not as discretionary as some people think, because a lot of us are, impel, are compelled to go see our families sure. uh, this time of year. So I do wonder how much that might overweigh some of the cost concerns and budgetary concerns. Maybe people will splurge a little bit because they want to go see. Yeah, you know, they'll mom, maybe cut back on the gifts, the yeah. actual physical gifts, perhaps. Oh, no. no, maybe not at Romaine Bostick's house, but. <laughs> Scarlett's ruining holiday season for us all. No, no, no. I'm just coming uh, up with a more economical way of doing it. All right. That's all. Well, not necessarily economical. I don't know if you ever shop at the old Restoration Hardware, RH, yeah. as they like to call it. That's a gigantic furniture, a little pricier here. Big catalogs. But apparently, our next uh, guest says they're actually building some momentum uh, in that luxury home.
appliance space. We're going to talk to an analyst uh, about that coming up next in our top calls. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side. Top calls, big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off today with VF Corp, owner of the apparel brands, Timberland Vans, North Face, you know them, JP Morgan, though, putting the stock on a negative catalyst watch ahead of next week's earnings report. The analyst, Matt Boss, says he's expecting a miss on sales and a potential lowering of the company's outlook. This amid volume headwinds and inventory risk. He maintains for now a neutral rating and a $16 price target. Investors bailing out down. 8% on the day. Next up, let's take a look at UPS, a rare sell equivalent rating for the shipping company. This one coming from Barclays, which downgrades to underweight, citing extreme pressure from rival FedEx. Barclays also flagging near-term risk from weakness in the overall freight environment and long-term risk from the potential loss in delivery volumes from Amazon. Those shares down 3%. And finally, let's talk about some good news. Warby Parker getting an upgrade today to buy from neutral over at Goldman, which sees several emerging tailwinds for the eyewear company. That includes emerging strength in the overall optical industry and a recent insurance partnership, which could scale into 2025. Those shares up 8% on the day and those are some of our top calls. We want to turn right now to the world of retail and specifically luxury home furnishing. Analysts over at Wedbush say you'd have to be blind not to see the extraordinary product and store momentum driving growth for the retailer RH. An upgrade to outperform today and the analyst behind that call joins us right now. Seth Basham is Managing Director for Retail Hardlines over at Wedbush. And let's talk about, this seems like the momentum that never ends. I, I know a lot of people have said at some point RH is just going to run out of steam. You go through a laundry list of things that you think are going to kind of I uh, guess keep this company invigorated, if you will. And you talk about the lineup of furniture. You talk about Reed furniture, which is kind of lost on me. Motion furniture, which is also lost on me. But you think these are things that are going to get people into the store, Seth? Yeah, I mean, let's talk about the big picture first. Uh, RH lost its way over the last two years. It really tried to move too far up the luxury mountain, as they called it, focusing on the high net worth customer. And they abandoned that core aspirational luxury customer. At the same time, they were so focused on getting product with the supply chain crisis and so focused on raising prices that they didn't really develop a lot of new product. Well, fast forward to today, and that's changed. They're back on track. They're going back after that core customer, the aspirational luxury customer. They're lowering prices to make it the furniture more affordable to that customer. And they have some really high quality, attractive collections that are hitting the stores these days. Reeded furniture, that's curved furniture, um, yeah. as well as motion furniture where the company has not played before. Those are two key trends in the furniture business these days, yeah. and they haven't been in them until now. So those are huge, along with another number of other collections that yeah. are just getting into the stores now. Well, talk to me about how they're going to get the message out, because they've kind of created, to a certain extent, this membership system, which to a certain extent is a little bit more of a, of a closed system. I don't really see, and I'm not a member, but I, I used to get catalogs all the time from them. I always sort of knew what they were doing. I don't feel like I know what they're doing right now. Yeah, the primary way that they advertise is through their source books. So they mailed more source books this year than they have in the last few years in terms of not just the number, but also the depth, how many people were receiving them, and also how many products and pages were in those catalogs. So they're getting their message out much better this year because they have something to tell people. They have a lot of new, exciting product to show people. Okay, they have new products to show people and new things to tell people about. Um, but in building out all this inventory and this new product selection, that must have cost something. Where is that showing up in the financials? Yeah, no doubt about it. They uh, are free cash flow negative this year. Not only are they aggressively building inventory, but they're aggressively building stores. And those are very expensive propositions. After meeting with the management team last week, we came away comfortable that those investments are going to pay off. The inventory investments provide insurance that they'll be able to meet the improvement in demand that they're seeing now. And the stores ultimately not only serve to be an advertisement to customers, but also attract that customer to that aspirational vision of luxury home furnishings. And some of the new stores they're building are just out of this world magnificent. 
You were saying earlier that uh, RH was reaching too high, perhaps going after the, the super high-end consumer, and now it's scaling back a little bit. So who is, its, who is its competition now? Who is it trying to compete against when it kind of overstretched? Yeah, so the primary competitors from a publicly traded standpoint would be companies like Our House. Uh, they also play off the top end of where William Sonoma plays or Ethan Allen. Uh, private competitors would be companies like Design Within Reach. Is it possible we could see more promotions out of mm. RH? I know this is something they've kind of avoided to a certain extent, but is it possible that that could become a formula or part of the formula for them? So this has been a big concern of investors over the last year or so. The company has been moving through a lot of that older, overpriced inventory, marking it down, and they still have elevated levels of clearance inventory. The bigger concern is whether or not this additional inventory they just added is not going to hit uh, properly. It's not going to be um, bought at full price and have to be marked down in the future. We think that's unlikely, as we discussed before. So ultimately, yeah. we think their gross margins are going materially higher from here and could potentially reach their peak where they were a few years ago in the 50 percent range. All right. Seth Basham over at Woodbush. Really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you so much. When was the last time you've gone to an RH? I mean, I, I get um, the catalogs and I can barely carry them. It's It's been quite some time. and But I remember years ago, I mean, we're talking like 10 plus years ago. Mm. I used to always get the catalogs and I bought a few things from them. I mean, they're decent pieces. But as you know, uh, there's a certain price point yep. and a certain size of home that you need to have in order to actually uh, be able to bring that stuff in. But I don't know. It feels like they just kind of disappeared from my zeitgeist. Mm. At least. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'm just not high net. They're not on your enough. Instagram feed. Uh, but it gets to this idea of who needs that, who wants that, particularly in an age where you just get pelted with the, you know, the uh, Wayfarers and, yes. and, that, and that quality of furniture. I know it's completely different, but if that's all you see, you're going to be more inclined to buy that stuff than to splurge on something that's maybe a little bit nicer. I agree. I yeah. also wonder to what extent it's leveraged to a recovery in the housing market, you know, a, yeah. a meaningful recovery once interest rates start coming down. Yeah, I mean, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's only so many billions and you know, multi-millionaires you can sell to, right? What about the people, Scarlet Food? Billionaires buy a lot of things. The people, you know, they need <laughs> couches to sit on. All right, let's talk about the people with Rob Holmes. He's president and CEO of Texas Capital but with nice his house. bank's outlook for next year in Texas. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in a gorgeous New York City. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlet Fu, and we're kicking off to a Why pretty we busy inside? week. I, I'm told it's like 95 degrees outside. We're always inside, yeah. Romaine. We're yeah. in a temperature-controlled environment. Can we do the show outside? I mean, uh, you just got to move the cameras or the something, The sun, right? the, the sweat. I don't know that that's such a great idea. <laughs> that's above my pay grade. I don't worry about those things. I just get on air and talk. <laughs> well, let's talk about the busy week that we yeah. have coming up, right? A lot yeah. of earnings, about one-fifth of the S&P 500, yeah. and the start of the Magnificent Seven reporting. Yeah, absolutely. And we got a big taste uh, last week, I guess, maybe Netflix, not quite tech, if you will. Yeah. But you got a little bit of taste here, maybe, what to expect. And, of course, we also had uh, the big banks reported as well. And some of the commentary out of the CEOs and CFOs I thought was pretty encouraging on the economic front. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're definitely looking for yeah. that soft landing, if at all, any kind of landing. Yeah. Well, let's uh, stick with the regional banks because shares of Texas Capital have risen more than 30 percent since its 2021 change in leadership when Rob Holmes took over as president and CEO after a 30-plus year stint at J.P. Morgan. And with more banks flocking to states like Texas for operations, Texas Capital is expanding its offerings in order to stand out from the pack. I'm pleased to say joining us now from our Texas Bureau, our Dallas Bureau specifically, is Rob Holmes, President and CEO of Texas Capital. Rob, welcome to the close. Since you joined the company, the bank has really undergone a transformation. Uh, I know that most of your corporate banking and middle level, middle uh, market banking is with firms in Texas, but you have built out this investment bank that kind of goes beyond the state uh, in improving fee income. Just briefly kind of recap your progress and tell us what is the single most important decision you made in building that out. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, we started the transformation uh, three years ago in the third quarter of this year. And uh, this most recent quarter, to your point about the investment bank, if you compare us uh, the fees uh, this year versus the third quarter of last year, they've risen 39 percent. We said we wanted to have a goal for fee generation of total revenues of 20 percent for the firm after the transformation is complete. We're at 19 percent this quarter. 
and, and over 10 percent for investment banking fees. We had a record quarter this quarter, had a record quarter last quarter. Uh, and the, the fees are way more granular mm -hmm. uh, than in the past. And there seems to be great acceptance. Um, right. Uh, we, sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, no, no. So uh, following on that, you talk about, um, you know, being in the state of Texas. Obviously, that means a, quite a presence for oil, gas and coal deal making. I'm wondering how much you've expanded past those industries to other sectors. Well, well, let's stop on uh, energy just for a second, because mm -hmm. uh, we, we sold made as the largest debt deal in the country uh, last year for a, for a company here in Texas that needed its balance sheet remade. Uh, but the, look, the health care is a very large part of the U.S. economy. We built subsectors to serve the corporate clients because we know you need extra industry expertise. So we have TMT, healthcare, FIG, uh, government not for profit, energy, diversified. Uh, and so we're doing very, very well in those in those spaces. And we try to stay diversified. So we don't let uh, loans in the energy business go above five to seven percent of uh -huh. LHI or loan sell for investment. And all of our subsectors have um, unique, uh, different capabilities like healthcare. You said, what would you do besides energy? Uh, healthcare, we do revenue cycle management. Um, we do asset based lending for healthcare receivables. A lot of people don't do that. We just bought a healthcare portfolio from another uh, bank, uh, and we're, that's growing really, really fast. As you know, it's 17 percent of the U.S. GDP, and it's growing faster than uh, the U.S. GDP. So we're excited about the different sub verticals that we're in, and, and we're making great progress. Well, what's the due diligence looking like, or, or more importantly, Rob, sort of what's the difficulty of due diligence look like in the current uh, economic and regulatory conditions? Well, uh, regulatory, uh, I would just say we have a great uh, relationship with the regulators. We treat them as a line of business. However, uh, there is inconsistency at some times between different regulatory bodies, which can be hard to navigate. They're working constructively with us to make sure that everybody interprets the same thing the right way and we move forward uh, well. On the uh, due diligence front going forward, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, as you know. And um, so, the, there's a deal making on the M&A side slow, slow down um, uh, for a while. And that's because, you know, I think it's hard to project uh, future earnings, to mm -hmm. your point, uh, especially uh, before the election. But um, it, it, it seems to be um, stabilizing, if you will. Risk is on. Triple C spreads, if you will, are as tight as they've been in quite some time. Equity markets are trading at a, at a high multiple. So risk seems to be back on, but that doesn't mean that foretelling the future, especially in an election year, is simple. I am curious, uh, too, just kind of about the evolution of Texas, from at least from a financial markets uh, perspective. And obviously, Texas Bank Shares has a long history. But as I'm sure you know, a lot of those you know Yankees from New York have uh, come down uh, and set up shop down there. And these are the big guys, you know, the Chases and the Goldmans and the J.P. Morgans, if you will. Are you scared, Rob? No, no, I'm not scared at all. I mean, we compete against them in every sub vertical. We compete against them in business banking and middle market banking. We led the largest so managed debt deal in the country this year, too. And yeah. we beat uh, money center banks last year and this year to do it. So uh, we're, we're doing just fine. And there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of talent moving here. I think it helps us that they're moving here and more talents moving here. Uh, there is a, a, a big investment by money center banks, but there's also a big investment by the financial sector in general, uh, family offices, private equity, hedge funds, mm -hmm. alternative capital. Uh, look at Canyon, uh, look at Fortress, uh, Mike Milliken's office. So th this is this is a great place to be, uh, Texas, um, for sure. And, you know, our sales and trading floor built from de novo uh, two short years ago. We've done over 170 billion of notional trades. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a top 10 desk in, in this uh, uh, mortgage market. Yep. And so we're, we're, we're embracing that and we, we welcome the talent. And that talent on our sales and trading floor is primarily from New York. So and I want to follow up on that idea that all this talent is flooding into Texas and you have that many more asset management firms to potentially partner with or compete against. Um, what areas are you looking into as the money scene in Texas broadens out? Well, we're, we started a, we, we just started public research in oil and gas for small mid-cap companies. 
Uh, we, we just founded a new uh, muni municipal bond business, which, as you know, Texas is number two in the issuance of debt, 3,000 issuers, 250 counties, 1,200 school districts. And so we're really, really excited about that. Did you know that since we've been keeping data since 2019, there hasn't been a Texas-based underwriter for muni debt in the top 10? We're welcome to take that place. And so we're excited about it. It's been well received. We're moving forward fast. We, yeah. announced, the, we announced the founding of our own private credit fund. Uh, we had a lot of uh, top brands uh, call us and ask us to partner uh, because we have the distribution. We have the expertise. We have the credit underwriting. We have the clients. We're the top lender to Texas-based business of any Texas-based bank. Yeah. So we decided to do it ourselves. And uh, we, we're going to target $500 million. We're launching that this quarter. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's mid-cap, middle market, or it's small, middle market, 30 to $40 million EBITDA companies that we'll be yeah. uh, targeting with that fund. All right, Rob, got to leave it there. Great conversation. Hope to have you back soon. Rob Holmes there. He's the president and CEO of Texas Capital, beaming in straight from our offices down in Dallas. Meanwhile, we come back here to New York City, where SIFMA is hosting its annual meeting, discussing the issues and opportunities that matter most for the capital markets. They've already had some very high-profile guests speaking today, including SEC Chair Gary Gensler and BlackRock's Larry Fink, who sat down with a fire, in a fireside chat with Ken Benson, the president and CEO of SIFMA. Take a listen as to what he had to say. And this is my message to every politician. We need to be unlocking growth from the private sector. And the U.S. is in the best position of any country in the world because of the scale of our capital markets. Um, and, and, you know, after spending two weeks of the last three weeks in Europe, the fact that they don't have a banking union or a capital markets union is going to be a lot more daunting there in Europe. Um, and, and, and so I look to the U.S. as a, as a great position, but we can't take that position for granted. We need to be unlocking uh, the capital markets, unlocking the opportunity we have in the private sector to really grow above trend line. And that is Larry Fink, of course, the chairman and CEO over at BlackRock, the man who was asking him questions. You didn't see him there, but you're going to see him right here. Kenneth Benson is the president and CEO at SIFMA, the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. Great to have you here in New York. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start off first with what Larry Fink was talking about, because he seemed to be pretty bullish on the idea of the structure of U.S. capital markets, at least relative to maybe what investors have in Europe. Absolutely. I mean, we fund 70% of commercial activity in the U.S. through the capital markets. That's the, the inverse of that in Europe, in Asia, and that's really what they're trying to build. If you look at how quickly the U.S. responded from the uh, pandemic, uh, that March 2020 period, uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. corpus were able to repair balance sheets, enter the markets. We had tr we had record uh, corporate bond issuance. That's a virtue of our markets that makes our economy stronger than any other economy in the world. What, what's the mood uh, at this conference with regards to the participants? Are they feeling relatively confident, not just about economic conditions, but also, of course, about uh, I guess government conditions, if you will, heading into 2025? I think in terms of financial yeah. conditions, I think people are feeling good about mm -hmm. it. The markets seem to be doing well. Uh, I mean, obviously, we have spouts of volatility and all, but upper, upper trajectory in, in the markets. We're seeing deal volume come back into the business, which is good after, you know, a little bit of a nadir going on. So I think that's that's positive. There's obviously some questions about short-term uh, uh, situations, election outcomes, obviously the global situation with war in, in, in the Middle East, war in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, pressure. So that puts on, the, on, on, on different parts of the economy. But I think overall, the business, I think, is looking positive. There's a lot of undertaking that the industry is having to do. As you know, we talked about, we just shorten the settlement cycle in the U.S. That was a big undertaking. Europe and, and the U.K. are going to do that pretty soon. Uh, we're doing, you know, talking a lot about, you know, bringing clearing, central clearing to the Treasury market. Such a huge undertaking with a big, an impact on the most important market in the world. So yeah. there's a lot of work ahead of us. On this issue of clearing, because this is going to be a big topic, and a lot of our investors that come in this program have talked about it, and there was just a story last week, even that that, that proposal of maybe clearing certain things uh, off outside the U.S., uh, basically over there in London. Is this something that you heard, particularly from some of the regulatory guests that you had there today? Well, I think the regulatory guests yeah. are very much bullish on us getting it done, but what we tried to mm -hmm. convey to them, the regulators still have some work to do, mm -hmm. the SEC in particular and the CFTC, and, yeah. and they've acknowledged this, they have work to do, particularly as it relates to the so-called done-away model, mm -hmm. and we're working on that. We just produced standardized documentation for the done-with model, mm -hmm. and I think that will move forward. But the other thing that's important is all of the training, uh, all, of the, all of the engagement with clients, counterparties to do this, and to get done by beginning, you know, next spring mm -hmm. and into 2026, that's a huge undertaking. So we need to be very 
careful mm -hmm. as we move forward. We're doing the work that needs to be done, but we need to pay attention. Regulators need to pay attention to make sure we don't do anything that breaks the market that should not be broken. Well, I mean, we heard, uh, you know, at the conference, uh, the participants, they heard from uh, uh, Ross Benham over at uh, CFTC, uh, Gary Gensler at the SEC. Um, Gary Gensler, not necessarily the most popular guy right now in financial markets. And there's an expectation that if Kamala Harris were elected, he might be a part of that administration as well. How does that sit right now with the participants at this conference who are going to face a regulatory, potentially a regulatory environment that is either as strict or maybe potentially stricter than what it is now? Well, we don't really know, right? Yeah. I think what we do know is that, that one, however the election turns out, there's going to be a new administration. Mm -hmm. uh, I would assume if it's a Harris administration, it will be different than the Biden administration. Obviously, a Trump administration will be different than the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll probably have a new uh, uh, players that we'll have to engage with. But as I've always said, you know, we're going to say the same thing to the people that, that we're saying now to the people that come in later. Mm -hmm. The importance of capital markets, the importance of making sure that our markets continue to operate efficiently, continue to help the economy grow. Mm -hmm. and and are really the envy of the world. And let's be careful not to overdo it and break something that's yeah. not broken. Do you have confidence right now that what we are seeing in capital markets with regards to price discovery and all the elements that go into that, that that is healthy right now? I think, I think it's as healthy as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it only gets more healthy because it's, it's, it, we, it, we see the embracing of technology, which this has always been a technologically driven market, mm -hmm. you know, going back to Quotrons and even before. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and that's always improving the market. We're seeing further electronification of the fixed income markets. Obviously, mm -hmm. the equity markets are fully electronified. Yeah. And I, I think we're just, that's just going to continue. There's been talk about sort of broadening out our financial system on a geographic basis. And we were just talking with Rob Holmes uh, down there in Texas, he used to be a representative uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, they're trying to set up a stock exchange down there, a financial markets exchange, as well as a few other things. Do you think there's, that's going to gain enough traction to have a meaningful impact? We'll see. I yeah. mean, it, it, we've seen new interests yeah. come into exchange markets. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of exchanges out there. You mm -hmm. know, getting volume is always uh, is always tricky. We'll see what happens. But there's a lot going on in Texas. I've been down yeah. there twice in the last yeah. two weeks to Houston and Lower Rio Grande Valley. There, there's a lot happening down well, there. Well, that's the whole point, though, right? It's not just somebody came up with this idea. You had a huge influx of major companies moving there, and now, of course, major investors moving there. So, in theory, it would make sense to maybe try to create some sort of a financial market system that would accommodate them. Right. It's the second yeah. most populous state in the in the nation. And, yeah. and very dynamic. So we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. All right. And when we get back to uh, the conference, and I know you've got to get back there here, uh, is there a sense coming out of this that as we head into 2025, all of the sort of unresolved issues, Basel III, which God knows when that's going to get done, but some of the other sort of uh, overhangs, if you will, about asset caps and other things that uh, might actually impact some of your member companies, do they have some sense here that that will be resolved next year? Well, there's still some uncertainty year. out there. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we would hope they'd be resolved, but they shouldn't be resolved in a bad way, right? So it's a good thing they're looking to repropose Basel III. It needs to be repropose. Uh, so regulators need to be thoughtful. They need to be deliberative and, and methodical in their approach. Mm -hmm. All right, Ken, I really appreciate you running over here. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, Ken Benson, he's the president and CEO over at CIFMA in New York today for that organization's annual meeting. All right, when we come back, we're going to continue to count you down to the closing bells. We are just about 15 minutes away. A conversation up ahead with Nadia Lovell, senior U.S. equity strategist and global wealth management over at UBS. This is The Close on Bloomberg. The exact precision of when you enter into allocating a fixed income is a little bit less meaningful in terms of investor returns than people had suspected back you know, when rates were back at 0%. The time is effectively now to begin to allocate to fixed income, which mm. there is a structural underweight, which remains, and then move beyond that. And so while people are fixated on the Fed, the yeah. reality is, is that this might be a more elongated process. Trump Schneider over at PIMCO kicking us off to the close about 10 minutes to go here. Uh, the action in the equity market a bit mixed here, but certainly much more de decisive in the Treasury space here. Mm -hmm. We're almost 10 basis points higher on that 10 year. Yeah, year. big move in the bond market, not so big in the equity market. As good as the earnings have been for the third quarter numbers, there's a growing sense that valuations are getting just a little too lofty. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, too. I mean, when you think about sort of what people were looking for, I mean, were they looking for just those big 
mega cap names, mm -hmm. and we haven't really gotten to them just yet. I mean, sans Netflix, we're going to get a few this week here. Uh, or are they waiting for that more cyclical, the idea that those mid and smaller cap companies will report and provide a reason to move into well, those names? Well, they're certainly hoping for the latter. As for yeah. the former, the verdict, the jury is out. And last quarter, we saw that a lot of the big tech names like NVIDIA didn't deliver. You mentioned um, the big tech names. Texas Instruments will be reporting. LAM Research will be reporting this week. A lot of question marks over what's going on in the semiconductor space. Absolutely. Here and a lot of questions going on about the aggregate market, aggregate market that a lot of people still remain wedded to here. The idea that any sort of downdrafts that you see in this market are just buying opportunities on the way to yet another record high. Nadia Lovell joining us right now, senior U.S. equity strategist over at UBS Global Wealth Management, counting us down to these closing bells. And Nadia, I want to start off here. We had this uh, MLive Pulse survey where they basically just uh, talked to a lot of Bloomberg users, terminal users, about where they think financial conditions are, where they think economic conditions are. And overall, the general consensus right now seems to be that this market, by year end, on the S&P, we're going to get to 6,000, and a lot of people think those gains will continue into 2025. Are you one of those folks? We are in that camp. I mean, we remain very constructive on the market. I mean, of course, remain, it, there will be some volatility along the way as we go through this earnings season and also the upcoming election. But when you look at the macro data that is coming in, including that strong retail sales that we had last week, um, that's pretty supportive for a market. We have a GDP that's trending towards over 3% for the third quarter. And so we think that should be supportive to markets as we enter into 2025. We think that this is a market that's likely to see 6,300 um, in the first half of the year, supported by pretty strong earnings growth. And the fact that you have a Fed, that will policy will become more accommodated as we progress through 25. Talk a little bit more about that earnings growth, Nadia, because there are pockets where we've seen a bit of a slowdown, other pockets that have been resilient. And I know in aggregate, we're probably still looking at somewhere around growth, at least based on Bloomberg numbers, around 6% or so uh, for uh, the current quarter or the current reporting season that we're in. Yes, you know, we are in the early innings of the earnings season, but so far we've been off to a pretty solid start. You're seeing companies beat expectations. I mean, it's coming in at about a, a four percentage point beat so far. Um, so that's roughly in line with our expectations. We were looking for above consensus expectations for the third quarter, looking for five to seven percent EPS growth. And I think what's important so far that the guidance has been fairly constructive and intact. In, in I mean, we'll get a lot more in the next couple of weeks. We saw that financials posted pretty good results. I mean, the fact that you have more support for a soft landing, that should bode well for financials. And we're seeing a pickup in capital markets activity. And even some of the early consumer companies are suggested that the consumer still remains in solid shape. We heard it from the banks and the consumer product companies that are not really seeing any meaningful slowdown. So we think that all that should help a broaden and out of that earnings growth. Um, as we get into next year as well, um, we think that you could see somewhere in the high single digits earnings growth for 2025, mm -hmm. and there could be even more upside to that. Nadia, which part of the market looks vulnerable when it comes to earnings growth? Which sector is going to, you know, when the numbers really start to roll in, is going to disappoint and show some big uh, drawdowns? I think you could see some weakness in, um, in energy. I mean, all prices have been quite volatile. Um, so you could see some pockets of weakness there. Also, it's not very clear in industrials. Uh, manufacturing PMIs have been in the doldrum for the last couple of years. Um, it does feel like we are starting to see some bottoming in some of the short cycle names, but still um, some overall weakness that could also be an area of, uh, of volatility and, and disappointment. What about utilities? I look at how much they've gained so far this year, <laughs> up 29 percent. They, of course, have become this AI play. And then mm -hmm. even in the second half of this year, they've done extremely well, again, on this AI play idea. Are the earnings going to justify those kinds of gains? Well, um, you know, utilities, yes, as you noted, up nearly 30 percent so far this year, I mean, on pace to see the best calendar year in some 25 years. And so this is a traditional defensive sector, as we know. And so earnings growth is not really um, the, um, the sort of strong story that you normally see in utilities. It's usually the place where people hide in sort of a storm. And so you, you see you usually see sort of a you know low to mid single digits earnings growth within utilities. But the secular growth story is there. I think that's what people are looking forward to playing to. You're seeing the hyperscales goes directly to these utilities to help build out 
data center, this is truly where the bottleneck is. It's not so much a tips. Mm -hmm. It's really getting power for the AI data center. So that's why we continue to like utilities. It has that defensive characteristics that can help tamper some volatility, but also it's at the center of some of these secular themes, whether it's AI or the energy transition. Are there other big secular structural themes, Nadia, that folks should be looking to in 2025? I think beyond AI, of course, which we continue to like and, and have a strong preference and attractiveness towards tech. Also, diabetes and obesity um, is an area that we like, as well as housing recovery. We know that the housing stocks have been somewhat uh, weak the last week or so as interest rates have moved back up. But the Fed is on course to continue to cut rates, and we think that mortgage rates will come down. There's a lot of pent-up demand in housing. And so when we get into 2025, we think that's going to provide a nice tailwind to some of the home builders as well as all of those other you know, furniture companies uh, as, as well as the home improvement companies in 2025. All right, Nadia, always a great conversation. We're going to have to leave it there. Nadia Lovell, Senior U.S. Equity Strategist and Global Wealth Management at UBS as we count you down to the closing bells, which are just about three minutes away here. A mixed bag for stocks. Interesting to see the massive underperformance today on the Russell 2000, down about 1.6 percent. That's versus basically a flat line on the S&P and NASDAQ. And I feel like just last week we were talking about the massive outperformance yes. of the Russell 2000. And this is a seesaw back and forth. It is. And yeah. I don't know that you can count on earnings to really change your trajectory for the Russell 2000, right? Because so many of the companies there aren't profitable. They're small yeah. companies. So it's really all dependent on sales growth. Yeah. And a lot of that sales growth will depend also on the overall economic condition and whether the Fed continues cutting rates. But I don't think we have any more clarity there, right? I mean, we no, went we from everyone right really confident that the Fed yeah. was on this sort of a uh, slide down, this water slide down. And now you had Torsten Slock at Apollo today positing pause. that they might actually pause in November. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure. How's the, the market going to take that, Scarlett Fu? The market is taking in stride because we're getting another piece of data that's going to change everyone's mind in about two weeks. Yeah. And uh, we should point out a Fed meeting that comes uh, the day uh, or a couple days after the election here as we move closer to the closing bells here on this Monday. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. The Closing Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic, alongside Scarlett Fu, taking you to the closing bell, a global simulcast. It has started already, Carol Masser. <laughs> Carol Masser and Tim Senevic joining us in the radio booth as we welcome our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. And that includes our partnership, Carol Masser. Yes. With you two. We were yeah. just talking about a house for sale in La Jolla. Did you see in this? Carol La Jolla. Speechless. The okay. Sandcastle Mansion that's listing for $108 million. The yeah. sand nice on the beach it. was imported. Um, From where? Augusta. National Golf Club. Yeah. You're and the on guy, the beach in California, and you still got to bring in sand from Georgia? The guy's like... That doesn't seem very eco-friendly there. The, no. no. Yeah. What did he say? Uh, it's the time to uh, time to sell? It's time to move on. Time to move on. <laughs> yeah. And then he's moving on to his yacht. Anyway, okay. As one does. As one does. As one does. Um, hey, you talk about the markets. I'm kind of obsessed with um, yields moving up. And I feel like, again, uh, people talking, what, about 5% now on the 10-year? Uh, concerns about deficit. So, you know, here we go, guys. Um, you know, thinking about maybe higher rates and maybe we won't get as many rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. Yeah, perhaps that's why we're seeing some real estate stocks, some home builder stocks uh, sliding a little bit as a result of these, these higher yields. And one area of weakness in the market today. Yeah, and overall, just a sense of maybe, you know, the rally that we've seen, which should continue, um, is going to start petering out. Uh, David Costin over at Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. seeing 3% uh, annual returns over the next 10 years as opposed to what uh, the 13% annual returns we've seen over the past decade. But just back to that home building point, because I, I think that's a good one, where we talk about this idea of this rotation that we continue to see. And a lot of what we're seeing sold today is a lot of the stuff that people have been rotating in really over the last five and a half weeks. So uh, I don't know if, if people know something we don't, because JP Powell hasn't spoken unless uh, I missed something. But unless he says otherwise, mm. aren't we still getting those rate cuts? I don't know. Feels uh, like we're pair, you know pairing them back. All right. Open Bank, Aspen Tech ringing the closing bells on the NASDAQ and NYSC as the Dow Jones Industrial Average closes out the day down about eight tenths of a percent. The S&P down two tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ composite and NASDAQ 100 holding on to modest gains on the day. But the big outperformance, if you will, that belongs to your small and mid cap names. S&P 400 mid caps down 1.2 percent. Dow Transports down 1.2 percent. And the Russell 2000, Carol Master, down 1.6. All right, going back to the big caps, the S&P 500, Romaine, and you are seeing, uh, in terms of the breakdown here, forgive me, uh, 
flipped around on a screen. Uh, you have a hundred. You were still uh, staring at that house, uh, the sandcastle. <laughs> she was actually looking at the boat. Yeah. She's got a She's yacht. On, yeah. 203 feet. Okay. Is this bigger than your boat, Carol Master? <laughs> it's a bit. Mine yeah. would be a dinghy next to it. Uh, this uh, S&P 500, 81 names to the upside, uh, 419 to the downside. So yeah, some pretty broad-based selling today, Scarlett. Yeah, and we did see the indexes close uh, you know, with a little bit of a tilt higher, uh, meaning they paired some of their losses into the close. But still, when you look at the sector breakdown, very much in the red. Uh, of course, the biggest sector in the S&P, the tech sector, is positive on the day. Nine-tenths of one percent gain, really powered by chip makers. But everything else is down, 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 led by real estate investment trusts, then healthcare, and then financials. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. Uh, your top gainer in the S&P 500, guys, is uh, Kenview. Uh, that stock finishing off its highs, but still a gain of about five and a half percent. Company rising the most in about two months. Activist investors, starboard value. We've seen the activist investors out yeah. big time, I feel like, with a lot of companies. So how do we unlock value in this? What? How do we unlock value? You mean further? Yeah. I, I mean, don't know. I mean, because that's what all the activists are doing here. What's, I, what's the value to be unlocked mm. here? I don't know. Uh, you they, combine it with J&J? Strategic I'm, alternatives. Thank, thank you, Tim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all the investment bankers around here. Um, I mean, it was spun out of J&J &J already, right? Um, I don't know. So this is according to a person familiar. <laughs> we don't know the stake. They say it's sizable. I guess you have to stay tuned on this. But nonetheless, investors taking note. And we'll see what, what more you do, right? Uh, so we'll take a look at that one. Uh, Spirit Airlines, uh, that one is an outperformer in a big way. Uh, the stock up about 53%. Um, this is after the carrier secured more time to address a troublesome debt load that has raised the prospect of bankruptcy, so they reached an agreement with the U.S. Bank National Association to extend a deadline by which the airline must extend or refinance its 2025 bonds to maintain its credit card processing uh, agreement with the bank. So there you have it. But investors moving big time into that one. And NVIDIA, um, you saw that uh, top gainer in the NASDAQ 100, a top gainer too in the S&P today, guys, up more than 4%. So finishing pretty much at its highs, I'm pretty sure. Is that a new record again? Um, because we've seen this one hitting, uh, it feels like record after record. Uh, so just a standout performer. Uh, in today's session. Yeah, looks like it's at another record close. All right, Carol's got the gainers. I got the decliners. I do want to start with uh, shares of UPS down 3.4% today. The company got a rare sell recommendation. Barclays expressed concern on UPS's earnings ahead of those third quarter results which we get later this week. Brandon Oglensky downgraded UPS to underweight from equal rate noting likely near-term risk to earnings from continued weakness in demand and then longer-term challenges from, yeah, you got it, Amazon doing more of its own delivery, and also from competitor FedEx. Also, Lumen Technology shares surged earlier in the session. They were higher by more than 15% early this morning. The company came out and said that it was partnering with Meta Platforms to increase the network capacity for Meta, all ahead of AI development for Meta Platforms. Later in the session, those shares reversed. Analysts said, hey, this was already priced into this stock. You had Raymond James writing that it's, quote, unclear if there's anything incremental in this announcement from what we previously knew was coming to Lumen. Shares falling uh, at the end of the that day. That's kind of a wet blanket. Percent. Yeah, I kind of lost track of the stock. Last time I checked, it was up like 10, 12% here. It had 15% And it closed, in, and closed in the red, yeah. all because of the analysts. Now. I guess it wasn't yeah, priced power. In. It wasn't totally <laughs> priced in. If it well, some people up. didn't think it was priced yeah. in. I know. Yeah. Um, VF Corp, parent company of Vans, North Face, Timberland, Dickies, and more, down 7.2% today. JP Morgan placing it on any negative catalyst watch ahead of the company's earnings report. Those are coming on October 28th. All right, let's take a look at yields. You had massive moves in that space today with your five-year Treasury up about 10 basis points, your 10- and 20-year up about 11 basis points, and even your 30-year yield also rising about 11 basis points here on the day, seven basis, eight basis points on the shorter end of the curve, and you put it all together here. These are some of the biggest moves that we've seen in a few months here. In fact, it matches some of the big moves that we saw at the start of the month when people really started to rethink whether we were going to get as many rate cuts had been priced in. It now seems people are thinking about the exact opposite here. Not so much rate cuts, but the idea that, well, we could be in for a pause and maybe a lengthy one. Yeah, we just had a story crossing. Um, Apollo's Torsten Slock sees rising chances the Fed will hold rates in November, which yeah. would be kind of interesting, right? That's a few days after the elections. Hey, you know what's kind of interesting, guys? I feel like, you know, we came off the pandemic and everybody was like, yeah, we're going to be flexible about how you work, work at home, work in the office. Uh, increasingly. Really? I never heard that. <laughs> that's because we came back into the yeah. office, what, like July, August of 2020? Or never left. It's a little different. Well, July, I, was I was here like early June. <laughs> well, anyway, a lot of companies allowed their Hi. work. 
um, a lot of companies allow their workers to stay home, but 3M now is calling back basically its bosses uh, for three oh. days. So they're dialing back a remote Shots friendly fired. policy. Yeah. Um, and this is, they've got a new head at the company who the previous ones seemed to be like, okay, we can be kind of flexible. Yeah. Three years they were able to, <laughs> if you worked at a desk, you could uh, f work remotely. It was called, uh, the policy was called work your way, but now they're going to be required to work the way that Bill Brown <laughs> worked as, uh, as, as, as soon as the policy has a name, that's when you know you're in trouble. Yeah. Well, you can no longer work your way. You got to work uh, Bill Brown's way. He took the reins back <laughs> nice. in May after that turbulent period of sluggish growth and legal setbacks. It's all fine until a company starts to not do so well. And then, uh, or the, or the economy turns and everyone's like, you know what, yeah, let's exactly. get them all back in. And yeah. we should point out that 3M does report tomorrow on that front. So maybe we'll find out how well mm -hmm. or not well they're doing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, maybe that means uh, fewer trips, fewer of those work um, vacation trips. Remember how those have become a big thing? Uh, there's an airport in New Zealand that is tired of cars clogging up its drop-off zone. You know, like if you go to JFK or LaGuardia here, it's like three cars deep. You can't even get in to, to drop off someone or pick someone up. Hmm. Now they're ha limiting farewell hugs to three minutes at its drop-off zone. Wow, what a place to live. <laughs> the Uber driver never gives me a hug when I get dropped off. You don't have loved ones to drop you off? A three-minute cap on hugs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's meant to be a friendly reminder to, to please use the car park if you actually need to do more than, you know, say goodbye. But otherwise, we want you to keep moving. What, what exactly would they do flowing. more of, Scarlett? So. <laughs> you know... Yeah. I'm not going to answer that. I, I think this is, this is just something unique about New York City, I yeah. think. Because if you are in a committed and loving relationship, you do not want your partner to have to go through dropping you off at the airport. It's oh, a that's gift. a good point. It's You're a right. gift to them not to have to drive you to the airport. I love you so much that I'm going to take myself to the airport. Yes. And then you're just looking for a hug from the Uber driver. What is it? It's just kind of rough. Can, Tim, can someone give Tim some love here? What's, what's happening? Tim has thought through all of this very carefully. <laughs> what's your, what's your Uber rating, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's weird. I'm banned. I don't know why. <laughs> all right, guys. That's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it uh, the closing bell. And uh, we will see you again. Same time, same place tomorrow. As we push ahead deeper into the program, we push ahead to 2025. J.P. Morgan Asset Management out with its long-term capital market assumptions, and that includes a 6.4% return forecast for the 60-40 portfolio. A breakdown up ahead in just a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic here on this Monday afternoon. An S&P in modest retreat here on the day. Of course, coming off a sixth straight week of gains. If you were looking for any bright spots, you could find that in the NASDAQ. Know the gains were modest, to be sure. The big move of the day, we saw that in the Treasury space, an 11, point, 11 basis point move higher on your 10-year yield. You saw similar moves, Scarlett, on the 5, the 20, and even the 30-year. Yeah, pretty remarkable moves and all uh, as maybe people are pricing out a rate cut in uh, November. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, in terms of big movers on the day, uh, Kenview was the best performer in the S&P 500, rising the most in about two months. Starboard Value taking a stake in the consumer products company. It wants to make changes to boost the share price. We don't know what kind of changes. We also don't know the size of the stake. Cigna and Humana each down at least two and a half percent. Cigna has revived efforts to buy Humana. We've been reporting on this. Remember, their deal talks fell apart last year over price. But of course, they'd have to get past regulators uh, to get anything going. And so a lot of talk right now now is that they'd have to wait for the elections to go by first before they move further. Yeah, and interesting moves that we're seeing in that healthcare space, particularly some of the comments we heard earlier in the program out of Rob Holmes over at Texas Capitol. But everybody is really trying to divine the future of, I guess, where we go next. And with all the changes going on in the world, now is the time to prepare your portfolios for a new economic era, an era of higher base rates, rising capital investment, geopolitical tensions, and inflation volatility. At least that's the view of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, which is out with its 2025 long-term capital markets assumptions report. Some of the changes in their assumptions from last year might actually surprise you. Joining us right now is David Kelly, the chief global strategist over at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, and Monica Issar, the global head of multi-asset and portfolio solutions at J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. Great to have both of you here on the set. We Glad get two for 
one today Great here. Great to be here. Uh, I'll start with you, David. Uh, yep. Pretty much on the economic assumptions yep. in this report, which seem relatively constructive, but not without challenge. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, we, we do this every year. This is the 29th year we've been doing it. And so we have to look back over the last year and see, well, what have we learned? And what we've learned is, first of all, the U.S. economy in particular, but the global economy has proven to be pretty resilient. Uh, and we're seeing in effects of AI, particularly in the U.S. Uh, economy, we're seeing better labor force growth than we thought we'd see. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to actually mark up our forecast for the long run for the U.S. It used to be 1.8 percent, now it's 2.0 mm -hmm. percent. Um, that's positive. And then the other positive is less inflation. Yeah. Because it turns out inflation really was a cyclical event associated with uh, the pandemic, the, the uh, response to the pandemic in Ukraine. And that has really faded here. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to mark down our CPI long term inflation forecast from 2.5 to 2.4. So now we're looking at 2.0% growth, 2.4% inflation out as an average over the next 10 to 15 years. And that is a very strong foundation mm -hmm. uh, for asset classes. So what does that mean, Monica, for your clients? I mean, are they going to share in that optimism? It seems like a lot of people are still kind of skittish. I, I think that's absolutely yeah. right. I mean, people are very focused on the higher points, whether it's equity markets, higher rates, higher volatility. But I think what they'll look through is is an opportunity when they're investing on a stronger foundation. So the fundamentals, we, we call it healthier fundamentals. The fundamentals, whether it's macro, as David just pointed out, or on the corporate side, right? We're seeing stronger earnings per share growth. When you think about earnings power, you're seeing margin improvements. Like this is an opportunity that tech adoption that David was talking about, that's not only gonna help in terms of revenue growth, but also importantly, improve margins. It's gonna help take away that no joy, no joy work that everybody has mm -hmm. and improve those margins. Yeah, a lot of no joy work uh, day in and day out. <laughs> what David was painting was kind of like an, a continuation of the U.S. exceptionalism thesis. Would that be fair to say that, that continues, but perhaps it's a little bit less exceptional going forward than it has been? It's a really good point. I mean, when we say U.S. equity dominance, when you think about AI or tech adoption, they've really been concentrated on a few companies, right? The MAG-7. We see a broadening out of the 493 companies mm. out in the S&P 500. And we see that tech adoption both helping, whether it's cap manifesting itself in terms of capital spending and in terms of um, also margin improvements. So that broadening out will be really important and it help the U.S. maintain that market capitalization for the rest of the world. What does that mean for a balanced portfolio? Is the 60-40 portfolio alive or dead, David? Well, it, it's it's alive, but but it, it, the but the challenges. I mean, this year we marked down our forecast for this because markets have been so successful. Mm -hmm. You know, you often read the, at the so the bumper sticker at the bottom of a of a report is you know past performance is not indicative of future returns. Actually, it is. Past great performance indicates more difficult returns going forward. But we, so we ha last year we're at 7.0 percent for a global equity U.S bond portfolio, 60-40. Now we're down, gone from 7 to 6.4. So it's, it's less. Um, but we, we do see plenty of opportunities um, in alternatives, um, in international equities, um, and also just within the way we manage equities. Because one of the things, you know, the, the, you're talking about challenges. We do have higher valuations, but we've also got a, a big concentration issue. Well, it's interesting, too, because uh, there was a note out from one of your competitors kind of talking about this idea that annualized returns for the S&P could enter sort of a new era of single-digit moves instead of the double-digit moves mm -hmm. we've enjoyed over this last decade. And a big part of that, and I'm actually going to pose this question to Monica, because a big part of that thesis was this idea is not necessarily that money's coming out of the market overall. It's just not going to be going into equities and, it, to David's point, into alternatives and into fixed income as well. Yeah, I think that, yeah. you know, when we look at this report is mm. focused on the long term. Yeah. And so absolutely, at these higher points, we're going to see some, and this is in our research, we're going to see some multiple compression mm. right, in traditional equities. But it doesn't mean that investors aren't going to be investing on that healthier foundation that we pointed out, whether it's macro or corporate. Yeah. And, and the balance of that is also, this is not just about stocks and bonds. We absolutely believe that this is an opportunity for investors to allocate to alternatives. I mean, this is a generational opportunity in real yeah. estate. All we've been reading about real estate is asset markdowns and price declines. Mm -hmm. We're going to change the dialogue and move that to investing in things like non-core real estate where the modernization of real estate, mm -hmm. the, the innovation, think yeah. data centers, cell towers, mm -hmm. um, that's a significant opportunity. Look at the capital spending going on with governments and private capital expenditures on infrastructure, really important areas for 
hedge against inflation, strong cash flow yields, right. that's going to be opportunities for investors. But sort of bring that back to us, uh, David, because when we talk about that spending, and even what you said there with government spending yeah. on infrastructure, a uh, positive. There's a lot of government spending on other yeah. things that could be a negative. And when you talk about the long-term nature of this report, looking out 10 years or more, at some point you've got to be factoring in the budget and balance sheets yeah. of the United States government. Well, yes, and I mean, and, and that's really why we, we so believe in diversified portfolios. And this is why we think this is really a call to action, because even though our macro forecast doesn't change that much, markets have moved a lot. They've become more concentrated. They've become more expensive for U.S. equities. And while we believe in the U.S. equity store, it's not without risk. And one of those risks is the budget. I mean, if we, if, if both, you know, our political system seems to be generating this huge upward trajectory on our debt, unlike, for example, Europe, where, where they've got slower growth, Mm -hmm. but they're also more careful about, about their budgets. And if this some, sometime comes back to bite us, you'd want to have some international exposure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been sort of a, a, either di directly or deliberately or passively have been shifting away from international exposure because as their U.S. portfolio goes up, if they didn't rebalance back to international, and that's been pretty hard, mm -hmm. they're finding they've got a smaller and smaller share of their wealth outside of large cap U.S. equities. And, that, and that's a risk. You mentioned something about inflation, um, how you mark down your forecast for inflation. So there'll be slower inflation, but certainly not a return to minimal inflation, right? The post-financial crisis, pre-COVID levels of inflation, those days are long gone. We, we think so. Uh, we, we don't think this is a very inflationary economy, but what we do think is we've got more active fiscal policy, more active monetary policy, and particularly in the United States, mm -hmm. if we've, you know, the, any, any hint of weakness and, oh, well, let's just do some more stimulus. I mean, this is the most stimulated economy. Uh, and, uh, but, it's, um, but that does you know, lead to somewhat higher inflation. And even if it didn't lead to higher inflation, the amount of money the government is borrowing yeah. will probably put a floor under long-term interest rates. So I, you know, I, I, I think inflation won't come down to where it was pre-pandemic, but particularly long-term interest rates are unlikely to come down to right. where they were pre-pandemic. And of course, Monica, you had to do this not knowing who's going to be in the White House uh, in 2025. What were some of the what's the most fundamental basic assumption you built in no matter who wins the White House? Well, th this is very focused, like I said, in the next 10 to 15 sure. years. A lot of us are focused on the near term. And so when we're looking out and, and David should touch on the on the election point. But when we're looking out and we're advising investors, you know, we're talking to them about the cash on the sidelines, for example, the six and, and know, half trillion dollars, in the money six and a half trillion dollars in money market funds. And when you think about that opportunity cost, because what we're talking to them about is their long term goals. Right. There's real risk to keeping in cash to meet those long term goals. And we, we actually did this analysis where we said if you had a hundred dollars and you forecast it out the next 10 years, that hundred dollars only goes to one hundred and thirty six dollars. If you're just in cash, that hundred dollars goes to one hundred and eighty dollars over the next 10 years. If you're in a 40, 60, 60, 40, and then with an alternative, just go greater than that. So we think that that's actually the biggest risk is uh, not meeting portfolios to meet your long term goals. Uh, since you kicked the election question back to me, yeah. David, uh, you get the short straw here. <laughs> and I do want to specifically hone in on this idea of protectionism. Yeah. We talk about the health of U.S. capital markets, but a big part of that health has been it's a relatively open yep. market and has been for centuries. What happens if this protectionist bent that we've seen from both parties to a certain extent mm -hmm. intensifies? Does that change your outlook? It does in the short run, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. uh, you know tariffs. Uh, any economist you have here will tell you that tariffs are a stupid idea, because you raise tariffs, it's it's a, it's almost a, a stagflation elixir. Mm -hmm. You can actually both achieve higher inflation and slow the global economy at the same time. Mm -hmm. But that's why they don't persist for very long, mm -hmm. and that's really why it's not something I want people to really focus on in long-term capital market assumptions. Because you know, if if we did have a sudden rise in protectionism from where we are right now, mm -hmm. um, it could cause some damage to the economy. Then everybody backs off, and and you know, maybe there are, there are trade agreements, and then the economy bounces back. And it's that bounce back in the economy and markets that I think is is so important. I mean, even after. After COVID, I mean, the pandemic, we, you know, what, what more seismic event could you have? And yet, if you'd gone to sleep just before the pandemic with your, with your, with your long-term portfolio, did nothing, and then woke up a year or two later, you're substantially richer for not trying to time it. So I, you know, we tend to fade the idea of trying to, trying to time a portfolio around elections. Take a careful look at what's, what's expensive, what's, what's cheap. Think about those, these long-term trends and, and base your, your portfolio on that rather than trying to A, guess the election yeah. and B, guess how the election is going to affect your portfolio because that second part is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Fool's errand. All right, David Kelly, Chief Global Strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management and Monica Isar, Global Head of Multi-Asset 
Market and Portfolio so Solutions at J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. Thank you both. All right, coming up, we've got the top three where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. for the top three where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories and first up is Carson Block the founder of Muddy Waters Capital known for finding overvalued companies to short now has a new take on the stock market just close your eyes and buy U.S. big caps take a listen there's a Fed put there's always a Fed put you know is there does there come a point in time when the system breaks and the Fed can't fix it theoretically yes in in our lifetimes I don't know uh, so I think for now, it probably just pays not to think too much. Just close your eyes and buy, um, you know, probably mag seven. Yeah, he says inflows from retirement funds will stay a key driver for further gains. Yeah, it's so interesting, too. It gets to this whole broader question here about really just the economics of being a short seller and the idea that the juice for a lot of folks, the majority of folks, is never worth the squeeze. So kind of interesting uh, to see Carson kind of evolve into, uh, I don't know, do we call him a long-only investor now <laughs> or, or maybe an index Bite investor here? Uh, I'm keeping an eye on Tim Cook, of course. He's best known as the CEO of Apple. But did you also know he's the longest tenured member of Nike's board of directors? And he's been instrumental here and trying to help steer this company to some of the doldrums that it's been through. Of course, he's been an advisor to the past CEOs and now to the new CEO. And I don't know. I mean, this is a guy who certainly knows a few things here about the retail environment, yeah. about consumer spending and supply chain. So I'm sure he has a lot to offer. And you see his glasses there um, and the, the frame on the side, how it's blue. Those are Nike glasses. They are they Nike glasses. And, and he's got his custom made Nike shoes that he's got on just made there you for go. Sir Tim Cook. All right, rounding out the top three, James Gorman, the former Morgan Stanley CEO, has been named chairman of the board at Disney. He succeeds Mark Parker, who, by the way, was formerly from Nike, so it all yeah. comes around. But uh, Gorman already heads up the board's succession here. planning, that's right, committee. And, you know, this is all yeah. part of Disney's long running effort to find a CEO to replace Bob Iger eventually. Yeah, early 2026 is what they're telling <laughs> us now. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm going to hold my breath for that, but at least when you have someone like Gorman, uh, who's experienced, and let's face it, helped to lead another CEO yes. transition just recently, uh, his own, uh, he obviously brings a lot to the table. It'll be interesting to see what kind of ideas they come up with here, because obviously replacing someone like Bob Iger, as we've seen, is a little more difficult. Yeah, it didn't work out the first time, did All right, a lot more coming up here on the big program, a closer look at what's been going on in the world of private credit. Jonathan Levine, the chair of Bain Capital, will be joining us in just a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. A survey from Goldman Sachs shows that investors want more exposure to the $1.7 trillion private credit market. Nearly half of limited partners surveyed say they're now allocating to secondaries and co-investment strategies. It's a pretty significant increase compared to last year. Goldman says the trend solidifies private credit as an asset class within an alternatives portfolio. Joining us now with his insights on this is Jonathan Levine. He is chair of Bain Capital. Jonathan, welcome back to The Close. Glad to be here. Um, let's just start kind of big picture. It, is demand for private credit cyclical? And I ask this because given where we are in the economic cycle, right, which is either a soft landing or no landing as the Fed begins its easing cycle and maybe pauses along the way. Yeah, so... Um, this is going to sound like both, but um, it is not cyclical um, because I think that the demand is increasing at various points in time. Sometimes it increases at a faster rate than other times. But um, good credit should theoretically be structured to last through a cycle. And one of the beauties of private credit is it's negotiated. Mm -hmm. And negotiated credits, at least our experience, is, you know, will have lower defaults. You'll be able to work them out. And I think as that strategy has gotten, has proven out over, over the last several decades, but most recently over the last 10 years, um, I think that people have gotten more comfortable in our increasing their allocations. Given where we are right now, how much activity is on hold because of the election and will likely kind of restart once uh, you do have an answer to, you know, who's in charge in Washington? That is a really good question. I think that it is um, industry specific. 
And I think that we are all thinking through all the different permutations of the election because obviously nobody knows. And in the House and the Senate also matter a lot, too. Yep. Um, so I think that there's in the main business as usual, but things that might do a lot of importing, things that might be impacted by tariffs, things that might be in, in, in impacted by wage or immigration, um, those types of things people are, are being a little more circumspect right now. When we talk about, though, the demand and the uh, cyclical or maybe non-cyclical nature of this, there's also been a lot of discussion about the broadening of the investor class in the private space. You're dealing that right now uh, with a lot more individual investors in a way that maybe we didn't see in the past. Does that change? the dynamics of what you expect out of demand? Um, you know, I think that the broadening of the credit market is a really good thing. Mm. I think the diversity of investors um, is, is a good thing, both globally, institutionally, and um, including some, some retail strategies. Uh, what I also think is people are beginning to realize that credit, uh, private credit is a very big, big um, Area. People used to just private credit meant junior subordinated middle market mess. Yeah, right. And then it became senior direct lending or and then mega. And I use as an example, just like Apple, Apple Bees and Apple Leisure are three companies that have Apple in the name. Right. They're very different in size, dynamics, capital needs. This is true of private credit. Mm. We tend to focus on the middle market, mm. um, and we do not do the mega Holdco um, deals. Um, we have a special situations business that does capital solution, mm. and that's how we approach it. There's very different strategies. There's people who do very only very, very large deals. There's right. people who only do senior. There's people who only do junior. Mm. And I think just like the equity market's developed, right. um, it's good that private credit's developing that way. Is it more difficult, though? I mean, going to a pension fund or going to institutional investors, explain explaining to them lockup periods, explaining to them cap rates, explaining to them all that stuff. That's one pitch. You got to do that on an individual basis or are you feeding that through advisors? Well, I think that uh, yeah. pension funds tend to have uh, pension advisors who have seen yeah. this, but more importantly, because the asset is maturing, yeah. it's not new. Yeah. So when I was doing this 15, 20 years ago, first you'd have to go in and do all that, explain what private credit is, explain the mm -hmm. premium you get, explain the trade-offs on risks versus covenant and size. Now it's, it's, it's a pretty mainstream asset class. Mm -hmm. So at least you start with that level of knowledge and you mm -hmm. go in and you're just explaining where in that market map your strategy fits. What about the risk side of that? Does that need to be explained or is that understood? Every investment yeah. uh, strategy, every manager should be explaining the risk. Yeah. And particularly debt managers, where our whole life is focusing on the downside. I always joke, it's always raining in our world. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, that is part of every single discussion. Have you ever met an economist? Because they might beat you, beat you on that. Yeah, although economists have both, it's rainy and it's sunny. Right. It just depends right. on your assumptions. <laughs> I mentioned how uh, in that Goldman survey, uh, nearly half of limited partners saying they're now allocating to secondaries. And we've seen um, a secondary market for direct loans kind of starting to develop. Uh, Bloomberg reported that Gallup Capital traded about a billion dollars of the debt in the first half. Do you see more of this happening? Is this taking off? I, you know, I, I still think it's pretty niche relative to the trillion dollar or greater than trillion dollar market this has become. I think anything that provides liquidity to markets is a good thing as long as the disclosures are right mm -hmm. and it's not resulting in some sort of, you know, panic selling. The only people who are selling are people desperately trying to get out of private assets. I also think you'll see some evergreen strategies developing, which will be another way of providing liquidity where people can invest for a period of time and then their investment winds down. Um, so once again, these innovations, as long as they go slowly, um, I think are good for the market. So does that mean Bain is not setting up a desk for that right now? We do not have a desk to do uh, secondaries. We we are buy and hold. What do you make, though, I mean, when we talk about this idea uh, of, of the broadening of the investor class and what they know, we've also seen some folks toy with this idea of ETFs and other types of products that are very common in public markets, but private markets, at least on the surface, you would think don't make as much sense. Does it make sense? Uh, we are a private firm that focuses on the investment return, not asset accumulation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily opine on something that we don't do and haven't looked at. Okay. Um, but um, for our perspective, if you're making good loans, one, it's really hard to create an ETF because, like, what is the index, right? ETFs are supposed to mirror an index. Mm -hmm. You know, are there ways of creating baskets of loans that are publicly traded or a hundred credit vehicle or something like that? 
sure, that, that's a way to provide access to people in a way they, they don't have. But I think it'd be awfully ha hard to have an ETF that's like the equivalent of the S&P 500 or even the bank loan index, which is the 100 largest loans. I'm, I'm curious about the role of big banks here, because it's almost like if you can't beat them, join them. They've been kind of left on the sidelines here with the development of private credit and the explosion of it. And Citi and Apollo are the latest firms to team up on private credit. Um, they have an exclusive partnership, right, to arrange about $25 billion of financing for corporate and PE clients. Would Bain be interested in setting something like that up, or is this kind of noise right now? Um, we have had discussions about origination partnerships, and we've had, uh, you know, some smaller JVs. Um, I, you know, I think that it's more of a sourcing vehicle. I think mm -hmm. banks want to need to be able to provide something for their clients. Apollo has the capital to do it. I think it will start at the higher, the bigger level, um, and then move down market. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. Uh, firms like ours just don't have the local offices and the originators that, um, that banks do. Um, but right now, I think it's probably going to be pretty specific to a few firms. All right, Jonathan, got to leave it there. Great conversation. Thank Jonathan you. Jonathan Levine is the chair of Bain Capital. All right, let's uh, just recap how markets traded on the day. As we've been noting, not a whole lot of movement in equities, a bit of a retreat from a record high, but the big movement, of course, was in the sell-off in treasuries. Uh, the yield on the 10-year spiking up by 11 basis points to 4.19%. Maybe there won't be a rate cut in November after the election. Well, Torsten Slock over Apollo certainly uh, posing that question today, but if you follow what we're seeing in the swaps market, they're not necessarily saying the Fed will pause, mm. but they certainly don't think we're going to get that uh, those three rate cuts, those 325 yeah. basis point rate cuts by the end of the year. And you're starting to see uh, the Trump trade really ripple through the different uh, asset classes, uh, the Mexican peso, for instance, uh, under some pain right now because of that. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Election Day here in the U.S. just about two weeks away with both presidential candidates making their final pitches to undecided voters. Kamala Harris hitting three states today, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, while Donald Trump campaign is right now ramping up splashy events, including a rally this coming weekend right here in New York at Madison Square Garden. Joining us right now to talk a little bit more about where we stand in the race is Wendy Schiller, professor of political science over at Brown University. All right, Wendy, I'd be remiss in not pointing out that early voting has started in quite a few states and jurisdictions around the country. Do the final two weeks matter? Early voting matters much more, you can argue, to Democrats than Republicans. Democrats tend to turn out early voting more than Republicans who really have same day surge voting. Trump is messaging that he wants everyone to get out the vote uh, on Election Day. That's really been his message. But the Republican Party has tried to shift and encourage their voters to get out the door early. We're seeing some interesting patterns in Georgia, North Carolina, a fairly high turnout among white voters and a pretty high turnout among black voters. But it's really going to be hard to tell among that white voting population, you know, how many are speaking for Harris and how many are now getting out the door early for the Republicans, particularly Trump. Based on your general read so far of both of these campaigns, are there specific areas that you think Harris and Trump should focus on in these final two weeks? Well, Harris has the money advantage and really, you know, really hammering home what a Trump presidency would look like. Uh, you know, people are arguing go negative, not go negative. But there are still just a few people who think I didn't vote for him in 2020. Do I want to vote for him again? Trying to get those last few voters is going to require being very aggressive about what it will look like to have Trump back in office. So that's one thing she's got to do. Trump seems to be content with riding the wave of his competitiveness. I think he's more competitive than people expected in a lot of quarters. So now he's just sort of celebrating what he can bring to the table. It's interesting. He's been doing more New York things. Yeah. You know, so that's an interesting strategy on their part, not really rushing out the door to get where he needs to go in the next two weeks, but really focusing on the glory of Trump. And that seems to really motivate his, vo his voting base. Yeah, he wants to pack them in at MSG. The polling suggests, Wendy, that there's a shift in momentum to Donald Trump. To what extent does voting matter, uh, does polling matter, excuse me, in each side getting out the vote? 
Well, it certainly should concern the Harris campaign that in the very last days, sort of the tilt is towards Trump. It means undecideds are leaning towards Trump, uh, who's seen as the challenger to Harris, who's the incumbent. So we, we have a theory that undecideds lean towards the challenger if they haven't decided by now. And Trump, although he was president, has portrayed himself as the challenger. So they've been successful in that. They're still statistically tied. So really, turnout on the ground can shift this race to either candidate and I think that's where the Harris campaign is really trying to move the needle, whereas Trump is trying to sort of reassure people he'll be you know, a reasonable, successful president like he was before. And as the polling has shifted towards Trump, has that followed for the down ballot races as well consistently? No. This is the curiosity in this race. We talk about polarization. We're seeing some significant stability in the polling for incumbent Democrats in swing states like Wisconsin, like Pennsylvania, for example, and even Nevada. Uh, you know, so Michigan's a little bit up in the air, but the Democrats are still leading. So that means people are consciously choosing the Democratic incumbent and may also vote for Donald Trump. Uh, that's good news for people who worry about polarization. It's sort of breaking the fever of not being willing to vote for both parties. It's just not great news for Harris. There's been a lot of discussion here about this November 5th election, Wendy, and the idea that on November 5th, we won't actually know who the winner is of that presidential election. We've already seen a lot of lawsuits teed up already to contest the results, even though we don't know the results here. But I think it could be certain here that a lot of those lawsuits will be filed one way or the other. Yes, and election officials are going to have to hold firm uh, on either side. We're seeing Georgia already under attack with the accusations of fraud again. It's the same team that certified the 2020 election that's in office in Georgia. North Carolina is the same thing. And we're going to see these battles all over the place uh, on who won. And we're not going to know for a couple of days, partially because of mail-in balloting, but also because every state runs their system differently. They count early ballots differently. It's going to take a couple of days to really sort out who won this election unless everybody pivots to one side or the other. Right now, the Harris campaign is trying to prevent that mm -hmm. from happening for the Trump campaign. Wendy, I don't think we've had an October surprise yet, and there's only 10 more days left in the month. Um, what corner might a surprise come from, do you think? It's very difficult to have an impactful October surprise when you have a former president running on one side and a current vice president on the other. I mean, you have to think that if something's going to come out and move the needle, we probably would know about it already. Uh, and then a lot of people have already voted. So that's the problem with sort of our elections today. We don't have a lot of newbies. We have a lot of people who are already well known. And I think the candidates even running for Senate, we have a lot of incumbents. So it's harder for something to surprise people as mm. we get close to Election Day. Wendy Schiller, professor of political science over at Brown University with two weeks to go into the official Election Day. Early voting, of course, has already started as the candidates really try to find uh, some way to sway whatever undecided voters are still out there. President Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, actually took the time uh, to go to a McDonald's. Now, we should point out this was a staged event. The McDonald's shut down uh, for the day, uh, set up some uh, supporters to drive through uh, the drive through while Donald Trump prepared some French fries and uh, served them out the drive through window. He was wearing the apron and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there McDonald's you have it. did make clear. No, no, hang that on. Let's see the technique, the fry technique. Oh, no. There's no way. <laughs> have no. you done this before? You know how to do it better? Yeah. Most of us, you know, we started our careers, you know, working, uh, you know, lower level jobs like this. But, you know, including he's learning. Kamala Harris, by the way. Yeah. Who, you know, that's part of her biography that she worked at McDonald's when she was a student. Um, Trump has made the, made the case that he has, she has not done that, which is not verified, obviously. Well, but um, no, no, it's not a case. I mean, she worked there. We know she worked there. And, and Trump he today, says otherwise. And he's lying. So Trump actually working here at the McDonald's there, shaking hands. And there you have it. Man of the people. Man of the people. Well, you know, one way. Um, the company did say, by the way, that McDonald's does not endorse candidates for elected office. And that's the case for this particular they race. They did not? No. Then why was he at a McDonald's? You know, it's up to the franchisee owner. Oh, and the franchisee owner did allow so it. So the franchise owner endorses. But McDonald's corporate says they don't. They said that we're not red or blue. We are golden. Mm. <laughs> they were golden. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, it looks like an endorsement to me. Donald Trump there shaking the fries there at your local McDonald's. When we come back, we're going to set you up for what to watch over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg.
Earning season now in full swing, with General Motors set to report quarterly results tomorrow, expected to highlight some U.S. market strength. Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch joins us now. So, David, I was looking in, revenue seen growing 1%. Uh, how much did General Motors have to offer discounts and incentives to move some of its vehicles? Less than the rest of the market did. GM was saying that their discounts in the third quarter are about 4.5% uh, of the average transaction price, whereas all their competitors, on average, were over 6%. So there's discounting going on because inventories have crept up. Uh, but GM's holding the line on pricing pretty well, uh, and considering their sales only fell 2% in the quarter, with most of that drop being in fleet, not retail. Uh, that their U.S. earnings should hold up pretty nicely. One of the big questions for the quarter will be, how did they do in China? Did they stop the losses there? They lost money in first and second quarter. It was kind of an ugly first half. And, and can they start to right the ship and, uh, and stop the bleeding and, and even maybe make a little buddy, bit of money there? Is there any sense here, Detroit? There's been a lot, uh, David, there's been a lot of talk here about the relationship that they have in China and the idea here that if it hasn't been paying dividends, why they continue down that road? Do they seek a new partnership? Do they pull out? Do they go it alone? Uh, it, it's really tough to go alone over there because the Chinese government just really wants players who are, who, you know, companies who are playing with the, with the domestic companies. And, uh, and you lose a lot in terms of branding and that sort of thing. GM's most successful brand over there is Wuling, which is a Chinese brand. All of its American brands, Cadillac, Chevy, and Buick, have been losing sales quickly. Look, they're going to have to just watch this. And over time, if they keep losing money there, if their sales keep falling, they're going to have to seriously look at leaving, just like they did Russia, mm. India, and, uh, and Europe. Well, we can't talk China without talking EVs. What does GM's EV business look like? I know that it's been losing money, but is that getting better? It is getting better. Uh, we'll, we'll see if, if they're going to show us any improvement in the third quarter. Uh, be, what's happening is that they're selling more EVs. They're getting more scale in their battery operations. Still a money loser at this point, but they're saying they should get into uh, just about break even point with it next year, which is about a two to four billion dollar savings for them. So uh, there are other headwinds out there uh, for, for GM looking into 2025, really for all the auto companies. But that will help stem some of that. And they're saying that their earnings should be pretty stable next year with this year, uh, which means you know, the third quarter shouldn't have any, any really bad surprises in terms of profits for the company. Are, are you convinced, David, that this idea, this commitment to electric vehicles or really alternative fuel vehicles over at GM, and I'm talking worldwide, that that is still intact? The Mary Barra is still going to pursue this full stop without any real break or interruption. I, I think that's their intent. Uh, whether or not they're, they're going to be able to produce everything they've committed to, we'll see. But by the end of this year, they'll have more than 10 electric vehicles on the market. They're launching a new GMC Sierra electric pickup right now, uh, along with the uh, Cadillac Escalade uh, IQ, the electric Escalade. Next year, they're going to have a new Chevy Bolt by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So by then, you're looking at about a dozen different EV nameplates that GM has. Uh, the only way they pull back is if they just don't build them because customers don't want them, but the commitment's there. They also just did a uh, more than $600 million deal to guarantee domestic supply of lithium for EV batteries. Yeah. So GM is putting money down. They're bringing vehicles to market, and I think they're hoping the customers will show up. All right. GM earnings uh, scheduled to uh, come out tomorrow before the bell. Bloomberg Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch there giving us a nice preview as we push ahead to some of the other potential market moving events over the next 24 hours, and that includes a lot of earnings. In addition to General Motors, we we get quite a few others, Scarlett. Yeah, we get something from the industrial sector, from the defense sector, from the telecom sector. General Electric, Lockheed Martin, Verizon, Norfolk Southern, also the paint company Sherwin-Williams will be reporting. And then after the market, you and I will be breaking Texas Instruments. Yeah, that could uh, maybe a little bit of a bellwether for what we hear from some of the other chip makers going forward here. We also get some economic data. This on the manufacturing side tomorrow morning. Which has not been doing great. Um, we know that this is kind of the weak link here in the U.S. economy that for the most part has held up better than expected. Also, Fed speak. I know your favorite. Who you Patrick got? Harker. You yeah. know, this comes before at some point they're going to go into, you know, the, the blackout period and we won't get to hear from these <laughs> guys. Let's just on get rid basis. of the blackout period. Just let them talk. <laughs> talk, 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 talk. All right, Patrick Harker uh, tomorrow. I don't know if we get any insights into where the Fed goes next. That's the market's betting on here. We are going to maybe get uh, a little bit of uh, insight into the economic outlook globally. Yes, the IMF 
uh, World Economic Outlook is uh, going to be uh, published. And there's also a BRICS summit kicking off tomorrow in Russia. But of course, we'll have a lot of conversations with folks from the IMF over the next couple of days. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they have. I mean, I feel like the actual forecast, I mean, I feel like they never really come to fruition. But if you will, I mean, the, the economists there, they do a good job, I think, of explaining their thought process, explaining some of the risks going forward. Not Identifying much more, the themes. And I'm much more interested in that than yeah. the actual hard number of whether they think we're going to grow 3% no, or 5% or whatever it is here. Uh, and if you're a sports fan, what's starting? The NBA season. The yeah, men's the NBA Knicks. season. The we New just York had the closing Knicks of the will, WNBA season. I know, season. and congratulations to the New York yeah. Liberty, by the way. Uh, yeah. The New York Knicks will be visiting the Boston Celtics. Yeah, they don't even start. Oh, the, the champions are all good, <laughs> good luck with that. Uh, the Knicks are supposed to be good this year, though, right? Yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, enthusiasm by Scarlett Pooh. I'll bring some more enthusiasm tomorrow. So will the team over at Balance of Power, which is up next.